So let's see if we can uh, um, make headway on the coordination aspect of the problem uh, today. Uh, I'm really, really, really happy to be joined by, by two for now, but hopefully very soon, three fantastic people. Uh, I won't take much time away from you uh, at all uh, so that you have time for your presentations. I'm uh, still currently finishing up the Hive Mind report, which is the report of uh, the kind of like, well, at, at one point, really 10, uh, 10 week global online container that we did to make sense of COVID-19 and to, to show other solutions out. And that report will be with you uh, hopefully at the end of next week. Uh, and I think it's really interesting because many of those hive mind salons were really pointing out that, you know, in times when the world proves vulnerable, uh, kind of top down solutions are really tempting, right? Um, they kind of like give an easy way out or supposedly so, but also, you know, that they suffer from a lot of categorical problems, such, for example, that they limit the intelligence that can be applied to a problem, they create single points of failure, they create the risk of internal and external abuse, uh, and, uh, and, and also first strike instabilities. So we pointed to a lot of those problems with examples that were popping up at, during the crisis. And then we also pointed to a lot of the ways in which decentralized communities, on the other hand, really have proven to be um, quite flexible and quite resilient in this crisis, right? And we had a few scenarios that really um, kind of like showcased people that were stepping up in incredible ways uh, within their communities. Um, and, you know, that we're really learning quite fast, that shared documentation, that shared resources. Uh, we had a, a bunch of groups that, you know, we're, we're forming around delivering medical equipment, producing medical equipment uh, and, and delivering food to those uh, who couldn't get it. And, you know, showcased a few solidarity funds, you know, that were uh, popping up uh, to really help uh, the people in need in their communities. So I think, you know, on a larger level that really kind of like has shown that uh, has proven uh, kind of like the strength of decentralized community, right? And, and also that the strength is kind of in the diversity of processes, right? There's a, a ton of different structures and agreements uh, and that really allows them to react in this quite anti-fragile manner um, and, and really become stronger as a consequence of, of Knox. Uh, on the other hand, we also saw that uh, sometimes the problems uh, for those communities, right, is this kind of like prefigurative politics and that, you know, many of the decision-making that happens um, is not built for fast decision making at scale. So today I'm really happy to actually have a few presentations uh, here that seek to change this um, by presenting decision making frameworks that really work. Um, and they either learn and pour it from those that already work uh, or they seek to uh, create entirely new uh, holocratic architectures. Uh, and I think we are also spanning uh, a bunch of different levels, right? We're spanning everything today from seeking to create totally new cities or zones uh, to improving one's own internal company decision-making to make it more flexible in times of crises uh, to really creating new uh, technological infrastructure based on blockchain technologies uh, on which uh, physical and virtual communities can uh, coordinate. And so we have a really wide range of presentations today. I can't wait for the presentations. I can't wait for your questions. Uh, please already collect them uh, in the chat. Uh, we have three presentations. There will be about 15 minutes followed by your questions. And we're gonna start uh, with Tom Bell. Um, and Tom will be speaking on the ULEX legal system and its application in Honduras to create already semi-autonomous governance uh, and regulation there. And uh, Tom practiced law. Uh, be before becoming the policy director of the Cado Institute and uh, is now a professor of law and published multiple, multiple books, really, uh, including Your Next Government from Nation States to Stateless Nations. And I'm going to share uh, a link to his work in here. And for now, I'm really excited to have you here, uh, Tom. Uh, and uh, you have a fantastic view, uh, beard style. Um, I'm always really pleased to see that in all the Zoom presentations. So I'm Without further ado, please take it away. I can't wait for your presentation and I'm gonna share more info in the chat. Hello everybody, I see some friends in the crowd. I'm pleased to see you and um, pleased to meet some new people. I'm gonna share my screen now to make it through some links quickly to share with you um, what I think you will find is some interesting stuff. So hopefully now I'm sharing a screen. I'm gonna to basically today offer you some material from this um, recent paper in the Journal of Special Jurisdictions, which I helped publish. It's uh, a production of the uh, Institute for Competitive Governance. And um, basically it's about how ULEX, this open source legal system, can apply to non-territorial governance. I have in mind most 
specifically here, uh, what I call distributed protocol communities. As Allison noted, this uh, material comes from my uh, forthcoming book. Uh, let me see if I can change the screen to that. Yeah, there we go. Um, that's on Amazon. I'll just say um, this remains, this book remains the single best source for material on ULEX. I'll share some other sources for you. I hope you're curious about ULEX. Um, but this remains the single best source. Unfortunately, you have to buy it. But there is an audiobook coming out, which will be cheap and maybe even free thanks to a supporter. And that's coming out soon. So look for the audiobook or, or listen for the audiobook. Here is the GitHub repository for ULEX. I know many of you are probably coders or at least are familiar with that community. And ULEX basically, you know, it's open source code. So we put it on, on, on GitHub. And uh, so you can go there. This particular version is the most recent 1.2. And you know, there it is. There's a bunch of rules. If you're curious, what does an open source legal system look like? This kind of gives you a quick look at it. So it's structured, so it has rules and, you know, basically, it's a, a lot of it is a collection of libraries of rules organized in a useful way. I'm going to move on, though. I want to show you some more things. You might be wondering, so what can you do with ULEX? Tom is going to tell us how it might apply to distributed communities, and I will. <laughs> but there's some other places in the real world that might or even are using ULEX. Um, seasteading, I'm a longtime fan of seasteading. I serve them pro bono. I work with Joe Quirk a lot. We got some exciting stuff going on. All I can say there is someday I hope there'll be a Seastead where we can run ULEX. Um, not going to happen tomorrow. Working on that. Another client, I, I'm an academic, but I, I work half time with clients. It's a complicated situation, but it suits me and my clients and my law school. <laughs> so I'm all happy about that. And one of my current big client is Free Society. The website is very out of date. They don't even name me, but basically it's, it's me and the the founder today, uh, these days, working on coding out this um, really great legal system. It's, it's the most pure of what I want to do out there. So I hope someday we get to roll this out and you can bet there'll be some ULEX going on there. Um, I'm also, if you're interested in this whole uh, space of special jurisdictions and competing governance, you might want to check out uh, Pronomos. I don't know why that's there, but um, Pronomos is a capital investment firm. I'm one of the advisors. It's set up by Patry Friedman, and I really like their work, and you might want to check that out. Let's look at Prospera quickly. Now, Prospera is basically the first real uh, special jurisdiction that's interesting to me that's up and running. And I worked on three different projects in Honduras over the years, and this is the last one, and it made it to launch. So yay, Prospera. It's in Roatan, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because the Roatan common law code, here it is, basically incorporates ULEX. So now, thanks to Prospera, I can point to a place on the map and say, they're kind of running ULEX there. It's, it's rather like, I liken it to uh, Linux, hence the name. Uh, or GNU Linux to you purists out there. And um, you might know that um, uh, Linux, Linux is running as a kernel, and this is my Android phone, and Linux is running inside of that operating system on my phone and on your phone too if you're running Android. And that is the most popular operating system in the world today. So, so basically Linux is a kernel in the Android operating system and ULEX is a kernel in the Rotan common law code which is running Prospera. So that's kind of cool. But let's talk about distributed communities. I got started in this field because here's another client I've worked uh, with. Um, I'm not working with them now, but I did some great work with them and they got me turned on to because they were turned on to distributed communities. And among other things they said to me was, Tom, figure out stuff. You know, we heard things about, I mean, they knew more than me on the coding side, but they wanted to know about the institutional and legal side of distributed communities. So one thing they had me work on was oracles. So this is basically a, a formalized picture of an oracle in a distributed protocol community. Suppose you're running a distributed protocol community. So it could be, uh, for example, uh, Tezos, you know, and you have people holding votes online through the protocol using tokens. Well, you know, once in a while have to have facts from the outer world come into your system. How do you do that in a, dis in a distributed community? Everything's happening online. Once in a while you have to kind of look outside the system and get facts. So for example, you might, have, you might have a distributed application that you know, invests in gold every time it sees the price of oil jump a certain percentage. It's just a protocol you've written and you want it to do this automatic trading for you. 
once in a while it has to look up and notice that the price of oil has gone up. How does it do that? It doesn't have direct connections to the outside world. You have to design the system to basically have sensory nerves. And the way you do that in a distributed protocol community is you use what they call oracles. I won't go through all the details of this a little illustration, but um, let me get rid of the URL so you won't look that up. Um, <laughs> this uh, might or might not make it in a paper someday. Um, but what I will say before I leave this is, is an oracle is merely, to a lawyer, a subset of what courts do. A court is an oracle. You go to the court and you say, hey, that guy slipped and fell on that sidewalk outside of that store. Was the store negligent in not sweeping away the snow before he slipped on it and fell? That's a question. And in this space, the real world, we go out and we go to a court and we can get answers. That's what a distributed protocol needs too. When it has a fight, hey, were those tokens legally issued? Should that guy be holding those tokens there? Did that person cheat that person in that transaction? You need to have an oracle resolve that question. And this means online communities have to have some kind of law. And so far, they have botched it completely. I have a paper coming out in this publication, the Independent Review, it's still in draft, so I can't share it with you yet. But what it does is it shares this kind of data. So this is a, one of the graphs. Unfortunately, it will be in black and white in the publication, but I like color, but they won't do that. And basically, this is a, from a paper that assesses the governance of distributed protocol communities. And yes, Bitcoin is in there. Bitcoin actually is a distributed protocol community. It's the leanest and meanest. They have hardly any governance at all. When they really get a problem, they just do a hard fork. And you know, there's things good and bad to say about that. I mean, they are still standing and it is the biggest. So there's a lot to be said for that. However, I'm also interested in, I think we should all be, if we're interested in Bitcoin, these other uh, protocol communities, basically. They're, they're, they're built around, like Bitcoin, uh, usually some kind of cryptocurrency, but many of these cryptocurrencies do a lot more. EOS, Tezos, uh, Dash, Decred. The ones down at the bottom, especially, are doing very ambitious things with governance. And they're not doing a good job. And that drives me crazy as a person who basically builds legal systems for a living. I look at these big rich, smart communities, and they're flubbing it on the law. They basically do not have good systems for resolving disputes, and it's going to blow up in their faces. It already has a few times. It really distresses me, and it's fixable. The good news is it's fixable, and I'm here to help. So let's talk about how distributed protocol communities can benefit from ULEX. Um, just got a few more pictures to show you, and then I'll look you eye in the eye, and uh, we'll talk about it some more. This is just one example of what version 1.2 of ULEX can do for you. It allows you to create on the fly adjudicative panels to resolve disputes. And you can see from this picture how it works in the first instance. So you're running, you're running uh, in, in something in the EOS community, and you have a fight with someone, and you're the plaintiff, and you say this defendant cheated you and you wanna sue them somehow, you want relief. How do you find a court? There's no court there. Actually, they pretend to the court and they don't have one, it's a mess. So here's how you should do it. This is borrowed from international commerce. I didn't make up this. Most of ULEX is not made up by me. I took my basket to the library and I said, I need tort law. Oh great, there's some tort law. I need a method of resolving disputes. Great, some people have already figured that out. And I put this all in my basket and I basically organize it and give it to the world. So here's what in international trade people do when they have a fight. They don't go, if you're a Spanish and a German company and you have a fight, you don't go to Spanish court, you don't go to German court. Nobody trusts that. You gotta find an independent body. So here's how they do it. I'll go back to my example of me and I have a fight with somebody. I pick a judge who takes an oath to be fair to the parties and has no conflicts. So it's an objective judge, but it's one, it's one I like. And then the party, the defendant on the other side chooses a judge, also takes an oath. It's a fair judge, but one they like. And those two judges choose a third judge. And there's your panel of three judges for resolving your dispute. It's important to have three judges because they can't tie. They can't have a tie vote. So that's already in ULEX version 1.1. 1.2 adds this appellate procedure. And if you've looked at the way oracles work, you'll realize, oh, it's super important to have an appellate procedure because the way it's being done now if you've looked at it the way I have for my clients, is not well done. It's just not well done. I'll, I'll go head to head with anybody that wants to debate current Oracle systems. I'm a huge fan of Augur, for example. Huge fan of that, that community. 
It's the best shot we have at good working real money prediction markets, and they have not done this right. It breaks my heart, but I'm here to help. So um, I'll say more about that, the ULEX in a second. I just want to wrap up here by saying um, I'm also doing this stuff through the Institute for Competitive Governance. You want to look that up. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I have a few minutes to just talk to you face to face. And so let's talk a little bit here. I have um, less than four minutes left about what ULEX can do for these communities and why I think it'll work. ULEX is ideal for a number of communities. Forgive me if I sell my baby. I'm, you know, I want to help the world. This is one way to do it. But it's especially well suited for distributed protocol communities. Why? Because ULEX flies no flags. Where else are you going to find a legal system that's going to work for everybody that's running in EOS or Tezos or even in Bitcoin? It's not going to work. You know, you get somebody who says, well, let's go take it to a U.S. court. And the other person says, I'm in Japan. I can't show up in court in Los Angeles to dispute this. And anyhow, I don't like U.S. laws. I'm a Japanese person. I just want my Bitcoin. And a person over in Argentina says the same thing. They get in a fight with somebody in Japan. Where are they going to go for a solution? You have to have a disembodied, non-territorial legal system. Not just the rules, but the method methods of resolving disputes. That all has to be non-territorial. No flags attached. The Argentinians not going to trust the Japanese flag. The Japanese not going to trust the United States. I think they're all right. <laughs> we shouldn't trust any of them. And so this is a chance for us to bootstrap the only kind of legal system I think will ultimately give us peace. It's using the best rules we can find, which are generated by not political sources. Every time you get a law that comes out of a political system, there's some lobbyist standing behind that process. Or it's just some politician who's got his you know, hand in the honey pot and he passes laws to benefit himself. You can't trust that stuff. It's junk. I wouldn't run it. I am stuck with it, but we don't, we don't want that. Nobody should want that. ULEX gets its rules from only private sources. Stuff like um, we get it from the American Law Institute. That's a, a tax exempt body. It's uh, built up from esteemed lawyers and judges and academics. And I won't pretend they're perfectly objective or all knowing, but they are more objective and knowing than your run of the mill legislature. The people who go into the ALI meetings and say, hmm, let's boil down the tort law and come up with a really nicely organized set of rules that captures the common law of tort. They don't have an incentive to lean towards the plaintiffs or the defendants. So that's an example. So UX gets all its rules from sources like the American Law Institute, the Uniform Law Council, the American Bar Association. There's a number of these, there's enough of them as it turns out, if you know where to look, a number of these private organizations that generate rule sets that the rest of us can borrow from. So that's what I did with ULEX. I went and found the best rules I could find authored by other people, not me. You don't have to trust me. You can trust me, but you shouldn't trust me because you don't know me, most of you. And I'm okay with that. Um, frankly, I wouldn't trust you to write my laws either. What we can both trust is this independent body where, which does all its work in public and it's staffed by people who are not being paid by lobbyists. That's where we should get our rules. So that's where I get all the rules from ULEX. And then I combined, I have to organize them in a certain way. I had to write a few kind of organizational rules or some meta rules that tell us which rules trump others when there's a fight. And um, yeah, there's some work involved. It's not as easy as just walking to the library and throwing stuff in a, in a basket, but that's part of it. So, so that's what ULEX is or where it comes from. And I think that's probably enough to get most of you aware of, huh, that, that, that could work. And it is working in Prospera, as far as we can tell. Prospera did just launch. So I can't say this has been running for years. We know that it works. All I can say is it seems like a good idea to me. And we've started running it. No blow ups yet. And I'm, I think it has a lot to say for itself. So I'm going to wrap All this right. up by saying there's ULEX and um, I hear you, Allison, and there's 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is fantastic. Um, okay, let's see. We have a ton of questions here. Uh, let's see how many we get to. I'm just going to unmute first Mike, then Mindy, then Tim. And maybe you can try to tackle those uh, in, in a few minutes. If not, then we just bump it all up until the end of this hour to allow the presenters to present first and then we have a longer discussion for those who want to stay on okay but for now let's see uh, okay mike I'm, I'm muting you first what's your question hi tom mike great presentation uh, and i was wondering uh, you mentioned it's been coded this ulex or is it coded into any specific languages like javascript maybe maybe no it's not okay. but actually 
Let me also unmute Mindy first for his question, and maybe you can uh, you can do them one in, in a row. Mindy? All right. So uh, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So um, uh, hi, Mike. So um, this is this is great to have a new protocol like Ulex. Uh, of course, it would be interesting to know. Uh, how developing ULS itself works like? Do you have any RFC-like request for comments-like process, uh, like in development of languages and protocols? And also uh, your specific example uh, about assigning judges, how, how can that be objective? Uh, like, uh, for example, judges can be bri bribed. Or, uh, they are not, they are, if they are humans, they are going to be participating in many other protocols or games outside of ULEX protocol. Uh, how does Ulex deal with that? And um, yeah, so these are some of the questions I have on mind Im immediately. Uh, Mike asked me, I heard a couple of questions. One was, how is it coded? Basically right now it's in English. Um, we are working on a project to basically develop plug-in modules that will allow people creating online contracts to automatically have a call out to Ulex procedures. I myself don't code much anymore. I mean, seriously, I mean, I studied Pascal. That's how long it's been since I coded. The last coding I did was Pascal and basic. Um, so I'm leaving that to some experts in our little community on GitHub, but we're working on that, Mike. Uh, we need to make progress. Mike, you also, I think it was you, Mike, um, asked about the interface with legacy legal systems. More or less, the quick answer is, it's not a problem. Um, almost all advanced uh, legal systems, including uh, the United States, allow private parties to invoke the law of their choice to resolve their disputes. So you and I, Mike, could decide, you know, we want to have Argentinian law decide our disputes. And we could go into a U.S. court and, and get that U.S. court to apply Argentinian law. It might take a pass saying, you know, we can't. But certainly they would say, you know, if you and I, Mike, agree, we're going to go use arbitrators who are skilled in Argentinian law to resolve our disputes because, yay, Argentina. That's just how we feel. Um, and, and you drag me into a U.S. district court saying, I want to sue you here, Tom. I'm gone. We're both gone. I walk into court just to show up and say, uh, Your Honor, look here. Mike said we're going to settle this in private arbitration using Argentinian law. And the court will say, well, then get out of my court. And that'll happen almost everywhere. Um, Mindy, I heard two questions from you. Um, one was about RFCs. Well, we're on GitHub. So basically, you know, if you have an issue, you can put an issue in there. You can join our little um, repository community there. It is very small. Um, that's about as, you know, it's just whatever you can do on GitHub, that's what we're doing. Um, I'm, again, I'm not the best guy at this. To me, this has been a learning curve. There's not many lawyers on GitHub, and so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it takes some learning. But I see strong parallels, of course, between coding and coding. It's all code, right? Legal code, computer code. And lastly, Mindy, your question was of conflict. I saw some other questions about this. So people seem to be wondering, well, how do you know the judges are gonna be honest? I'll tell you something about ULEX. We don't have governmental immunity. There's no governmental immunity in ULEX. Hacks me off that it happens everywhere else. And it's, everyone's talking these days about qualified immunity for police. It's not just the police people. There's a whole chapter in my book, Your Next Government, about how government agents across the board claim, especially in the United States, oh, you can't sue us. Well, that's wrong. It's wrong on many fronts, and we don't do that in ULEX. So if you've got a judge that acts unfairly, first of all, the judge takes an oath, so they make a promise. There's no conflicts, I will be objective. And then if you catch them violating that oath, you sue them. You sue them and they will pay damages. You try that in your local US federal district court. Makes me sick at heart. That's one reason I wrote you, Lex, is to do a better, uh, have a better approach for the law. If you can't have judges, okay. you your judges. Sorry, Al, I'm getting upset, Allison. Yes, there's your answer. And rent. <laughs> Okay, awesome, lovely. Next one up, we have uh, Brian Robertson, and I, I, you know, for those who want to stay on longer, you know, feel free to do so, and we're gonna like get into more ranty discussions. That I'm sure. Um, all right, next one up, we have Brian Robertson. Brian, thank you so so much for joining. Um, you've given a really fantastic uh, TEDx on. Uh, I'm hoping parts of the uh, solution that you're presenting today. I'm gonna share it all here. But uh, Brian, you're like a really experienced entrepreneur, right? And quite an organizational pioneer. Uh, and you've even uh, authored a, a book on holacracy um, as a new management system for a rapidly changing world. And uh, I think you're gonna tell us all about what holacracy actually is 
and how it can help not only your company or bureaucracies, but even yourself in self-management. So I, I think, you know, one of the things that I've always really wanted to see in Hive Minds is like, okay, how can people, like in, in the Hive Mind uh, salons, was like, how can people change their lives now, like tomorrow, you know, how, what would it mean to actually have more decentralized protocols in your companies? Uh, and so thank you for taking that on. I can't wait for your presentation and I can't wait for the discussions afterwards. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. And, and thanks, Tom. Uh, I actually took a deep dive into Ulex a few weeks ago, and it's been on my list to like find a way to connect with Tom since then. So <laughs> then this showed up, and that's convenient. Um, yeah, big fan. Uh, so yeah, let me share some more of what I do uh, with Holacracy. And uh, let me just start with a story that frames kind of my journey that led to this. So I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I build organizations, have done that for many, many years. And about 20 years ago, when I was building my first uh, sizable organization, uh, software company. Uh, I was also learning to fly an airplane. And uh, along the flight, so I, I had this one particular flight. It was, I was still a student pilot technically, and it was time for my first cross country solo flight. In other words, the first time I'm getting up in the air with no instructor going hundreds of miles away. And along the journey, the low voltage light comes on on my instrument panel. And you know, they don't teach you much about the airplane hardware. I really don't know what that means. Um, I, uh, my instinct though is check my other instruments, right? So one by one, I look at every other instrument on that dashboard, right? And one by one, every other instrument says, everything's fine, nothing to worry about, nothing's wrong, right? I'm not losing airspeed, airspeed indicator's fine, navigation's on course, uh, fuel's fine. Every other instrument says everything's okay. So I figured this must not be that big of a deal. Right? I'm just going to ignore it and keep flying. It's only one instrument reporting anything anomalous. Turns out that was a really bad decision. <laughs> I nearly crashed the airplane that day. I ended up completely lost in a storm with no navigation, no radios, no lights, uh, almost out of fuel, and violating international airspace. Right? So uh, bad, bad thing. And it started when I ignored just the one lone instrument, sensing something that no one else did. Um, and as I got down, I did make it down, barely, and, and as I'm, I'm sorting through this, I, I realized this is what's happening in companies all the time. In fact, this is what drove me to be an entrepreneur and start my own company. I got tired of being the low voltage light in companies, right? When we humans show up in organizations, we become the instruments. We sense reality on its behalf, and we try to integrate that into the flight plan and get something to change, and it's often extremely difficult especially if you're the one lone person sensing something that no one else does. And I imagine if you're listening to this, you've probably had that experience. <laughs> you've probably been the low voltage light at some point where you sense something that no one else does and find it almost impossible to drive change in the system around you. I think that's even more heightened in our, our world today. When there's a shock in your external environment, and I think the vast majority of companies in the world today are dealing with some serious shocks in their external environment, when you have that, it becomes even more important that people can drive change to deal with it, to iterate, to evolve something in how the organization functions. But the vast majority of organizations today are not built for that. They're not built to harness the inputs from everyone involved and drive change. And I found even as a CEO building my software company, I found it hard to drive change too. I was wrong that starting my own business would actually make that substantially easier it's still difficult. There's something about the structure itself that seems to resist the effort to drive change. So this started me on a quest. How can I build a company where anything sensed by anyone anywhere in the business can drive change as long as it's relevant to the purpose? And I had no idea what the answer was, but I turned my company into a laboratory. And over years, I experimented. I tried every new process and idea and technique and anything I could find to allow and free people to drive meaningful change in their areas without hurting the rest of the business. And there are a lot of challenges that came up along the way, but I wanna share with you some of where I landed, which is a system now called Holacracy that's used by about a thousand, more than a thousand now organizations all over the world. Um, but first I wanna talk about the paradigm because one of the things I, I had discovered along this journey was a very different control paradigm. And so just to use a metaphor, here are two control paradigms that we see in, in cities for controlling flow or traffic in this case through, through a, uh, an organization, a city. 
Right, the left, we have stoplights. That's one paradigm for controlling flow of traffic. On the right, traffic circles. I find this interesting. There's been studies done on these two now. Uh, one of them is actually far more efficient. One of them gets more cars through in less time than the other. Anyone know what that is? It's, it's actually the traffic circle, far more efficient. Gets far more traffic through per time, period of time than stoplights. There's been other studies that have looked at safety. Right? Uh, in other words, what, where is the rate of accident less per car? And that's also the traffic circle. The traffic circle is both more effective, more efficient, and safer than the stoplight. It is all around better from almost all measures that we've studied. And yet, which one's harder to drive in? <laughs> I think also the traffic circle. Which requires more of the driver? Right? I think also the traffic circle. In a stoplight, in that paradigm, you give up your autonomy and your authority to some external agent, right? You wait for some external agent to tell you when to stop, when to go, what to do, what the bounds are, right? You get to sit back and just give up your agency in that system. Wait to be told what to do. But in the traffic circle, you can't do that. There is no external agency or authority telling you what to do. You have to take responsibility for your part in that system, and you have to coordinate in real time consciously with everyone else who's doing the exact same thing. Right? There is no single point of top-down order and control, and yet it works better. It requires more consciousness, more awareness, but it works better. Now, which of these control paradigms seems like what we have in most modern companies? Right? I'd say it's very much the one on the left. Right? We have the typical way of organizing in most companies today is a top-down management hierarchy. We centralize power at the top of a hierarchy with a CEO or something equivalent, and we break it down. We try to delegate and create clarity through those ranks of who does what. We break down work. We get alignment and accountability. We need all of these things. We need work breakdown. We need clarity of boundaries. We need alignment. We need accountability. This is the control paradigm we have in most companies. And we need the functions it provides. We need management, but we don't necessarily need to organize it this way to get to the functions, alignment, accountability, control. What I discovered at first, I didn't even question this. I just assumed this was the only way to do it. I think most entrepreneurs probably make that assumption. But over years of experimentation, I learned there are other ways of achieving order that don't necessarily involve top down, breakdown, work breakdown, down a, a command hierarchy to get there, right? Um, the result of that experimentation of many years was a framework called Holacracy, which is a replacement for the management hierarchy. In companies, the thousand some companies running with Holacracy today, there is no management hierarchy. There's nothing that looks like a management hierarchy. There are no bosses and subordinates, but there is structure, there's alignment. When I say there, the companies running with Holacracy have no management hierarchy, people often hear no structure, and that's not the case at all. Uh, companies running with Holacracy are more structured, not less than management hierarchy. They just get to structure differently. They have a different way of getting there, right? Um, let, me, let me tell a, a little bit more about that. I'll get more concrete with an example, but to use one more metaphor first, think about how life organizes. We have trillions of cells in our body, and there's no CEO cell telling the others what to do. There's no top-down command hierarchy of cells bossing around subordinate cells. Every cell has autonomy. It has its own internal process and it self-organizes, right? There's inputs and outputs, but within that there's a self-organizing process. And yet they're also not entirely independent. When our cells become self-directing, we call that cancer and it's generally not healthy. They're part of a larger whole. There is alignment there. There's self-organization, but then there's an integration. The heart's job is not to micromanage the heart cells. It's to build on the autonomy offered by the nerve cells, the muscle cells, the blood cells into a larger whole function. One that provides some higher order of magnitude function that is itself an autonomous self-organizing whole, but yet part of a larger system, a cardiovascular system. This is nature's way of, of dealing with complexity at scale. And, and it is far more adaptable when you, you can rely on the self-organization of every layer and every level. You get a system that can actually respond better, especially to external shocks. But I want to say a few more words about this, some counterintuitive things I learned along the way. Um, I, I see a lot of leaders who want, you know, more empowerment, which is right. This is, you know, you can think of that as one function of this, 
who want more empowerment, more freedom for people to adapt. One of the, the mistaken goals I often see is they start throwing out all of the things that today are in the way of empowerment. They throw out all the rules, all the structure, all the, the you know, anything policies, anything that seems like it's, it's bureaucratic, they get rid of. And it's not a bad thing to get rid of a lot of the bureaucratic artifacts, but when you throw out all of it, you don't end up with more empowerment. If you go to your team tomorrow and you say, good news guys, no more rules of any sort, you're all empowered, good luck. You don't end up with a more empowered team. You end up with a lot of really confused people. Right? Because people know there are really some limits. There's something they shouldn't do without talking to someone. And if they don't know what that is, they're going to spend their time trying to figure it out and play politics instead of leading within the boundaries. If you don't know your limits, you don't know your freedom. Right? If you don't know what you can't do, you don't know what you can do without talking to anyone. Right? If you want to clarify and empower and liberate, you need people to know as much as their freedom, the limits of it. Those are two sides of the same coin. So real empowerment requires clarifying the boundaries beyond which you can't do something so that you know what you can do without crossing them. And it also requires clear expectations. Your empowerment will be dependent on others. And if you don't know what you can fairly expect of them, you're gonna spend a lot of your time either playing politics and coming to consensus, or you're gonna spend time dealing with the ramifications of having misaligned expectations. You need alignment, you need clear expectations. You don't necessarily need consensus on everything. It's one of the other myths. When people hear no managers, they often think all decisions must be made by groups and meetings with consensus. And that is not the case. Holacracy is more autocratic than management hierarchy, not more consensus oriented. The difference is it's a decentralized distributed autocracy, just like society. I don't need to call a meeting of my neighborhood to figure out how to redecorate my kitchen. I know it's my kitchen. It's within my boundaries. It's mine to lead. I have relationships. I have boundaries with my neighbors. I have agreements with my neighbors, but I don't need their buy-in and their consensus. In most management hierarchies, we call big meetings to try to get everyone's buy-in because we don't know what's ours to lead. So let me put all this together and give an example. Holacracy is a role-based system. Here's a role I'm filling right now for you. It's one of about 30 roles I fill in my company. So this isn't my entire job description. There's no such thing in Holacracy. I fill 30 different roles. My job is the sum total of those 30 roles. They're in like five different teams in my company. So I'm not stuck at one place in a hierarchy. Um, this is one role. Every role has a purpose. Holacracy is a purpose-driven system. It breaks down purpose to every role level. And I have some accountabilities, which tell everyone who works with me, here's what you can expect of my role. Because we have this level of clarity, including of boundaries, which I'll come back to, Holacracy can take a stance, which it does, to serve my role, I have the complete power, the freedom to make any decision or take any action anywhere in the company to get my job done, as long as there's no rule against it. This is the opposite of the way most companies work. In most companies, the implicit norm is don't do anything you don't normally do without permission. You get permission by either getting the boss on board or calling that big meeting and getting everyone bought in. With Holacracy, you don't need permission. You already have it. You can take any decision or any action anywhere in the company to get your job done without talking to anyone to serve your role's purpose or accountabilities, unless there's a rule against it. And you will need some limits. You do need some rules against it. There's probably something you don't want someone else doing in your company without checking with you. So the burden then becomes on the people to protect your area to get the clear limits you need on others put in place so that people can lead within those boundaries. Here's an example. I work with another guy filling our web architect role and his role has a domain. Think of that as a property right. His role controls our website. So if I can do anything I want in my spokesperson role, but if I want to impact or exert control on the website, that's our web architect's property. I need to check in with him first and make sure he's okay with it. Doesn't matter whether I'm the founder of the company and he's our newest hire. All that matters is his role controls the website. It's distributed control. It's property rights, right? Just like in an in open market or a free society. We know what's ours to control and where our neighbor's property lines are. So this is one way we break up control, but it's actually not enough. If you want to see this absolutely collapse in bureaucratic mess, Try to define all this up front. Good luck. You will not be able to, in any complex organization, define the right structure up front. And if you do, it's a moving target anyway. COVID happens, and that changes everything about how you need to organize. So what you really need is a process. 
not a one-time upfront structure, but a process to change boundaries and expectations to let them evolve over time. You need the equivalent of a common law process. Sorry, I'm gonna use all these legal metaphors because I just listened to Tom, um, right? You need the equivalent of that in your organization. And Holacracy does that by adding a governance process in every team. This is my company's org chart. There's no top-down command hierarchy, but we do have an org chart. Every one of these green and blue dots is a role, right? And every one of the circles, circles group roles together. And every circle is holding a governance meeting about once a month, maybe more frequent when they're new, varies per team, but about once a month. Um, and in that governance meeting, which you can also do asynchronously, in that, that process, anyone filling a role on the team is invited to come in and propose a change to any other role on the team or any policy of the team. We can create new roles, we can merge them, split them, we can add domains or property rights to roles, or we can remove them and limit them. We can change the governance of the team, the structure, the expectations, the power structure of the team. And there's a whole process for that. I don't have time to get into, but there's more about it on our website if you want to dig in. Um, really cool process. Gives everyone a voice, but doesn't fall prey to what I call the tyranny of consensus, where everyone has a voice, but no one can drive any change. Um, so here's an example of how this actually worked. True story. One day, this is my spokesperson role. When we first created this role in my company, it didn't have this long list of accountabilities. It had a purpose and just one accountability. It was mostly empty. We said, start with that, that's all we know for now. Good luck, do your best. And I wanna share where the third accountability on my role came from, defining criteria for acceptable speaking engagements. That came because another role I worked with, our casting agent role. Our casting agent role has to book me for talks. We get a lot of invites to speak at conferences and she has to sort through them. She negotiates with the conference organizer, price, terms, you know, length, all that. Uh, and she builds a relationship with them as part of that. And then at the end of her process, she was presenting me the opportunity. She built a relationship, negotiated, presented it to me. And sometimes I would shoot it down and say, nope, I'm not going to go to that conference. It's not worth my time or the wrong market, not big enough, whatever. And imagine how that feels for her, right? She feels disempowered. She spent all this time, built a relationship. So she shows up at our governance meeting and she says, I propose we add that expectation on your role. Right? This is how we get alignment. It's not just total autonomy, it's alignment as well. She said, I need to expect you to define your speaking, your criteria for, for engagements, because if I could see that, I can assess it myself at the beginning of my process before I waste all the time negotiating. It took about two minutes in that governance meeting for that expectation to get out into my role. And then she could turn to me afterwards and say, so when do you think you'll have a draft of that done for me by? Now, the footnote of this story I find really interesting. I'm the founder of the company and a seasoned CEO and, and many years before. She was our newest hire right out of college. In what companies do you know where the newest hire right out of college in two minutes can add an expectation onto the founder and then turn to him and say, so when will you have that done for me by? It's not about politics or status or egos. It's about we have purposes to fulfill, we have roles here, and we have a governance process to define the intersection of our roles. It wasn't even about me and her. It was about the spokesperson role and the casting agent role right? and what they need to expect from each other. And the rules of this governance process and this whole game are captured in a constitution. Right? It's actually an open source document. Um, it's in GitHub. I <laughs> was inspired. I love how Tom showed that. We have our own open source rule system uh, in GitHub, a constitution. Um, it's used by the thousands of companies today doing this. Um, it is workable and all that, but most companies don't need to because it's not telling you how to govern your specific company. It's not saying here's the roles you should have or the processes. It's defining your meta process, your governance framework. It's saying, here's, here's what roles are. Here's the authority that get conveyed when you fill a role. Here's how you define a role. Here are the limits to your authority and how you define that. And here's the governance process and the decision-making process used in governance on every team to come up with that. So it's a meta framework that allows you to dynamically adjust any and every other process in your company, every role, everything. It is a constitutional power structure which means when a CEO is ready to shift from management hierarchy to holacracy, they can sign that constitution like a king ceding their power into a different legal system. And then this becomes rule of law. 
And you can hold the king to it because there is no king anymore. Uh, and you can even adopt it in legal bylaws, which my company and several others have done. This is enforceable in court if it needs to be. Although once I, I found you, Lex, I gave it to our internal legal guy and said, you need to, <laughs> you need to change our jurisdiction. But um, yeah, so this is, it, it, it's a legal framework if you want it to be. It can also be adopted before that point just by policy of a CEO before you're ready to start messing with your bylaws, which is a great first step before you want to go all in. Um, that in a nutshell is a completely different way to run a decentralized evolutionary organization and one that does actually free anyone, even that newest hire right out of college, to actually drive meaningful change when they sense something that could be better than what it is. And that makes companies so much more adaptable to anything, especially when you have some kind of major shock in their system like today. Okay. That's all I got. I don't know how much time we have left, but I'll let our uh, trusty host tell me if we have time for questions. If not, I'll stick around for a bit afterwards. We have one minute for questions. Um, so Mike, I will go ahead and unmute you now. Uh, hi. Hello. Yeah, that's a good uh, presentation. I loved it. I was wondering, are you familiar with liquid democracy? And if so, how that would fit in with holacracy? in an organization, especially if it were more for uh, political governance and not just a corporate structure? Yeah, um, it's one of the points I often make. Holacracy is not intended to be a governance structure of or by people. This is not a form of democracy. If I love uh, to, to contrast it to Lincoln's quote, democracy is governance of the people, by the people, for the people. This is not that, right? This is governance of the organization for the purpose through the people. But the point is not to govern us as people. The point is to govern this entity that we have, we have created over here that has a purpose to serve, and we are the agents showing up to do that, right? Um, we are not directly the beneficiaries. We're not directly the people being governed. Um, to, or to use a metaphor, it's kind of like being parents. As parents, your job is not to, to use your children as your property, right? You're, you are their stewards for a while, but your job is to govern them for their sake for their life, not for your benefit. And I think that's very true when we sign up to serve an organization, you know, as workers. There's a separate issue we can talk about, but not now as uh, um, for the financial shareholders or whatever, but even that I have some different thoughts on. But as workers, which is what Holacracy is governing, the work of the organization, the work process, the structure, we're there as an agent, not for our own sake, but kind of like parents. We're there to steward, shepherd, and serve the purpose of this thing. And Holacracy's constitution really encodes that. It doesn't let people vote for their personal interests. Even to drive a change in the governance structure, you have to be able to show up with an example of how it got in the way of the work you're doing in your role and how it would actually solve that. There's a, almost a Socratic dialogue process built into the governance process to make thank sure that we're- so seeing much. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you, Brian. Well, I am awesome. hoping that uh, the participants can convince all of you guys in the chat to stay on for longer. Uh, Let's see what, what your other commitments are. But for now, are you going to talk today about distributed governance architectures and specifically the DAO stack holographic consensus model? And um, you have been uh, really, uh, I think, have been or really still are. I, I don't think you you uh, you get rid of that so quickly. Uh, I've been started out as a theoretical physicist, and you've done your postdoc in string theory even. And then six years ago, you discovered the uh, blockchain. You're like, okay, well, I'm going to quit academia which is what you did, and uh, you then became full-on focused on decentralized autonomous organizations. You've done a bunch of uh, research together as well with Primavera, and uh, now you're the CEO of DAOStack, and DAOStack is trying to uh, create decentralized frameworks for decentralized organizations. All right, so uh, specifically, DAOStack is an open source software stack that is designed to support a global collaborative networks of different decentralized or, or autonomous organizations uh, that run on peer-to-peer -peer software backbones and can really empower groups to make non-hierarchical decisions about shared resources, like for example, funds. Why I think it's interesting is I think that you are really calling out that problem of like a single point of failure. Um, and that's something that we've been calling out a lot in the uh, HiveMind and uh, doing the HiveMind um, workshop really. Uh, and so you're trying to do this very, very hard thing by trying to, to build something that is decentralized 
uh, and responsive uh, to uh, all the different actors involved uh, while still being actionable. So I'm really, really excited for what you have to share with us. I'm hoping that maybe you will first pick people up on what's a DAO and why is it interesting uh, before you launch into different uh, governance models there. And um, yeah, maybe perhaps uh, in the Q&A we get even to discuss things like uh, DAO democracy and other uh, recent um, recent publications that came out by Ralph Merkel and Co. Uh, I think which are making a really interesting case on how DAOs could actually uh, transform much of our current um, legal and political infrastructure. So super excited to have you here. Uh, and yes, please take it away. So what is a good governance system? What would be good governance rules? Um, a primary component in governance systems is reputation systems. So reputation means different voting power for different agents. So basically what we call meritocracy. Um, we'll get back to that. Uh, DAOs is decentralized autonomous organization. And let me be a little bit more uh, detailed here. So what do we mean by decentralization? So this decentralization means that there is a wide distribution of reputation. So there's no few points of failure. There's no few, point, few members of the organization that can make decisions on their own. So there is a wide distribution of reputation, which also means that there is a wide alignment of interest in particular and in, in that case, no increasing power concentration and better long-term engagement. So I think that connects very well with what uh, Brian taught us. And then a primary component in governance systems is the rules for reputation flows. So how does reputation, how does voting power flows according to the agent's actions and collective decisions? And in particular, the DAO itself, the organization itself can decide how to allocate voting power to different people People that represent better uh, decisions can get, for example, more reputation, but of course then we need to have sophisticated rules to signal for that. What do we mean by autonomous? Autonomous means that this organization cannot be shut down by an external agency, including governments, including the legal system itself. And this is of course achieved by the blockchain. So the organizations, the entire organization operates fully by code on the blockchain. So it's fully sensorless uh, and it's fully autonomous. And I'll show you examples. So without getting to, without trying to answer the entire question, but good governance systems also includes good reputation distribution. What do I mean by good reputation distribution? Such that it can make good choices um, and in some sense the, the right people or the people who have the knowledge hold more reputation. And this of course, we, we assume that everyone can actually vote on everything. So we assume that those reputation holders are available to vote and here I want to touch the biggest problem. What if not everyone are voting on everything? Clearly, they cannot. And this is the main problem in, in scalable governance, so I will, I will expand that. So the scale, what is the scale problem? So the scale problem is that, so firstly, what do we mean by scale? So scale means scale of decision frequency. So not necessarily, um, not necessarily the scale of the organization, although it is related, so we mean by scale of decision frequency, which means that we have many active agenda proposers. Uh, Im imagine that we have a million people in the organizations, but not just people that are doing things, but also proposing agenda items, proposing, shall we do this, shall we do that? So we have many, many active agenda proposers. So it's an open agenda. So just be a little bit mathematic here. Let's, let's take some unit of time. We have N agents, okay, the voters. And let's just that take the unit of time, the period of time that these N agents on average would make N proposals for the organizations. Then there is a physical parameter, which is just the number of votes in that same unit of time that a reasonable human or that an average human can vote uh, wisely on, can actually look at it and make, make decisions. So that, that would be F. So there's F votes that the, the person, normal person, an average person uh, can make in that unit of time. And then it means that in that unit of time from N uh, proposals, only F over N members or the, the voting ratio, voting rate would only be F over N. As, and what you can see is that when N goes to infinity, F, since F, N, F is a physical parameter, it doesn't change, then F over N goes to zero. What that meant is that when you grow the organization, as long as everyone are participating, when you grow the organization, it means that each decision, it's almost a trivial statement, each decision is looked by less and less percentage of the organization, eventually goes to zero. 
I want, I'll skip the remark on the delegation. Um, and then what we define as resilience, resilience means that those F agents that actually voted on each decision do represent the end voters. So do represent the, the, the knowledge and also the interest of those end voters. And of course the scale problem or the scale is that we can take N to infinity, we can be as, as big as we want. And the scale problem or the scale challenge is how do we take N to infinity? How do we reach uh, a, a gigantic organizations, but while maintaining resilience, while each decision is made by small number of people and yet represent the larger majority? How do we do that? So the only logical solution, just, just, just changing words, the only logical solution is that uh, F people, so small number of people, makes a decision for N people, for a very, very large number of people, while guaranteeing representation of the end people. So let's say we have a million people in the organization. Let's say that every person would suggest an agenda once a month. So, once, so every month we would have one million agenda items. And let's say that uh, each, each person in that organization can look at over 100 decisions. So each decision on average will get 100 voters so how do we make those 100 voters to actually represent the knowledge and interest of a million people? So, this is a, so if we have a protocol that does that, this is the definition of holographic consensus. This is analogy to a hologram where you can look at every pixel of the hologram and you actually see the entire picture. So this is what we call or define holographic consensus. So I will be very quick here how we, do, how we achieve that. So we, we, we have designed a protocol that achieves that. So quickly about voting system, only the voters, it's really important to say only voters makes the decision at, at the end, so they are the governors. Um, they can make a decision if they have absolute majority. If more than 50% of all voters, of, or actually more, more than 50% of reputation holders of reputation votes for something, it, it's automatically uh, being approved. But the big question, how do we, or when do we uh, make a relative majority valid? So relative majority is that when, when we open a voting, for a certain period of time, let's say for three days, for a week. And then at the end of that week, whoever votes in makes a decision. And if the majority, the relative majority of those voters say yes, it is approved. If say, say no, it's uh, disproved. So when do we uh, render relative majority finite time to be, um, uh, to be valid when the decisions are representative? And then of course, how do we make, ensure that these decisions are representative? We make this prediction game. So parallel to voting, there are predictors, and predictors serve as safeguard to the voting process. So how do, we do, how do they do that? Predictors place staking, so there's, there's a certain capital that they need to stake, to risk, and they make a prediction on whether those F, those small number of people who made the votes, actually represent uh, the, the entire global majority and they make it per decision. So they go, they actually make that for, for their work. And in fact, we actually design bots to make algo predictions just as bots, they make algo trading. So then it can be a mixture of course of human and bots. So for each decision in every organization, there will be predictors or bot, bot predictors who will place staking and make a prediction whether that decision is reflective or not reflective of the entire organization. And Sufficient, there, there needs to be a sufficient staking prediction, uh, only if sufficient staking prediction, uh, uh, sorry, prediction staking uh, is, is made positive on the fact that the decision is representative, is reflective, only then it renders a decision which is achieved by a local absolute majority, only then it makes it uh, val valid or viable for the entire organization. And of course, I should have also said, that why, why do predictors do that? Because if they make right predictions, if they predict correctly with the voters, retrospectively, they make profit. If they predict incorrectly, they lose their stake. So the, the, the whole system, the prediction system as a whole, like an economy, has an incentive to predict the right thing. And, only, and also it, it constantly improves itself because those who make the right predictions make profit and they make more poor predictions. Those who make uh, on average, wrong predictions, they lose their stake and, and basically die out. So the whole system as a whole is constantly improving. Um, this is about holographic consensus. Few words about DAO stack. So DAO stack is, is a totally generic framework for any autonomous governance on the blockchain. So ARC, this is the base layer 
of smart contracts on the, on the, on the blockchain of Ethereum that provides, uh, when I say totally generic, it means that you can basically code into this framework any sort of governance system. So any, it's logically complete. Any a, a set of rules can be coded into that framework. Then when we say the DAO stack, what we mean is that there is a, a stack of layers that eventually make this governance framework totally ac accessible uh, for, you know, for usual developers, such as uh, 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 using JavaScript and even uh, the, the React framework. And to end this, let me also show you some examples. So this is, today we have two applications running on the DAO stack. One of them is Alchemy, the other one is Common. Alchemy is serving a full decentralization and, and that today with the technology that we have today means some compromise on UX. And Common that we're launching next month is serving full user experience. So it's really uh, uh, directed to the mainstream and would make some compromises on decentralization. So these are the different organizations deployed on the, on the framework. Um, and let me show you one of them. So this is this organization, the XDAO, is an organization of a few hundreds of members, I think around four or 500 members. Um, you can look. These are the different governance rules that are deployed by the organizations. Each governance set of each each set of rules can do different things, can make different decisions. Um, for example, this governance scheme here, this plugin uh, allows the organization to distribute funds and voting power or reputation to members or not to members. This over here, the plugin manager itself, uh, allows to change the rules themselves. So I can I can now suggest a new set of rules for the organization in code, and then I can propose that to the organization. And if, if they approve, it's automatically added to, this, uh, to the code, and now you can have a new uh, uh, rules in the organization. So if you enter here, you can see the different proposals that this organization is making. This is these four or 500 uh, voters. I would say a few tens of them are actually active. So someone is, uh, for example, is made work for the organization, he's actually made, uh, deployed some code for the organization and he's asking, he's asking voting power, as you see here, reputation is voting power. So he's, has, he's asking voting power for his contribution and you can see people here are voting. You can see that only three people are voting, but uh, that's where predictions come in. You see someone, well, everyone predicted that this would pass and that's why people are not bothering to vote on top of that because they, Basically, as long as you agree, there's just no need to vote on it because you know it's going to pass. But notice that nobody, this 250 uh, prediction against of it is actually the automatic default prediction by the organization. It's the subsidy that incentivizes the predictions uh, to make predictions. So actually it means that nobody predicted against that, that uh, decision, which means that likely it's very reflective of the larger majority because any person in the world that thinks that this is not reflective can make a negative prediction over here and actually make profit and a, and a significant profit. This is like a hundred dollar. Um, let's see another one. In another one, uh, there is another work or maybe it's the same work that is asking for funds. So this is real funds. This is about $8,000 that's being asked as a payout for this work. And again, there is a total agreement and nobody, uh, nobody uh, reject it and so on and so forth. So this is uh, the DXDAO. There's a few more organizations. Uh, you can also look at the members of the organization. Again, there's like about 400 uh, addresses. As you can see, most of them are actually anonymous, although, although the system allows them to identify themselves, most of them are anonymous. Um, they, by the way, I'll show you one more nice thing. History, you can sh you see all of the decisions that this organization has made. Um, it takes a little bit of time because this actually reads from the blockchain, although there is a middleware uh, that is called the graph that index the data on the blockchain. So you can see all the decisions, how they passed or, or, or got rejected and so on and so forth. If you, one really last thing to say about this organization, the interesting thing about it, this organization actually, as I told you before, holds permission to change the code of another system. So this, this organization holds several products, real, real products on the blockchain. One of them is a decentralized exchange. So this is DutchX. And if I enter here, I can make a new proposal to actually, I can, I, can, I can propose to change the code, the parameters 
of a, of a real product somewhere else. And if the organization will approve the change, it will actually change the product. So this is, this is the future of the centrals organizations. Um, I can show you a little bit more here. Um, yeah, you can also all hold an ENS. So this organization actually has a domain which is fully autonomous. It's a domain that is linked uh, uh, through Ethereum. So it's, it's, you don't need the DNS for that. And, and, and the, 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 the DAO itself holds that uh, ENS. Maybe the last thing to show you, the last thing to show you can also, with a few clicks on a button, you can create your own organization. So you can create a DAO. You can make a, parameter, you can make a, a name of the DAO. So, so let's make it a test DAO. And with a, a symbol, the token make TST. So let's set this description. We can set it, we could configure the protocol. So there's quite elaborate protocol here. We can make it to be more slow decision-making, medium decision or fast decision-making, uh, which makes decision in two to seven days. Uh, we can tune some parameters uh, to be uh, op operated or not. Uh, we can set the configuration. We can add, uh, this is just me, I'm just adding myself. Uh, right now I'm opening the organization just with myself. And then we can actually launch it. Um, installing the organization. I'm not sure if you see my MetaMask, but right now I'm, I'm, I would sign um, the transaction. So let's make it uh, fast. Well, fast is expensive right now, a lot, as you can see, but let's do it anyway. Um, Okay, so you know what, let's, let's not do it. I, I'm not sure even to pass. I think we need two transactions. But as you see right now, the Ethereum blockchain is very congested. So a fast transaction would cost $43, $44, and we will need both of them. So it would be $100 to install an organization. Uh, in, in times where the, organization, the, the blockchain is less congested, it would be more like, uh, more like uh, uh, $10. And right now we're actually changing the whole architecture. So the, this application is running on our, old architecture and we are, we are migrating now to our new architecture, which reduced those costs uh, by, by about a factor of 10. Um, and in fact, the, and so this is kind of the user experience that we are compromising on that I just told you. In our second app in Common, we run the whole uh, application on a side chain of Ethereum, which then makes the gas cost uh, very low and even uh, invisible. But let, let me end with this. Can you see me? I'm hoping you can hear me. Yes, yes, okay, I can see you. Okay, lovely. Okay, we have a, a number of different questions uh, and I'm gonna unmute uh, Chris Hibbert first for this question. There we go. That looks like I'm unmuted now. I think I think we raced to to hit it, and I hit it when before you hit it. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. That was very good. I really like the idea of using prediction markets to help adjudicate things. Uh, but I wonder what the incentive feedback is uh, if you seldom take votes of the entire electorate to find out uh, what the outcome of the vote would have been. How do you give the voters uh, the right incentives to actually vote for? Uh, um, the, the right outcome? How, how do they know? I can't hear you. There you go. I mean, I mean, the voters just, just can vote whatever they want. Um, I mean, the voters and the predictors are not necessarily, are necessarily not the same set of people. So the voters is, is a permission set of people, only those who hold reputation. Predictors are anyone who will just want to participate in the prediction. Um, so we are, for example, we are running bot bot prediction, prediction bots. Um, so most of the volume eventually would be totally made by prediction bots, external to the organization. Um, the prediction game is played in a way that if you, so you firstly make prediction, eventually there is a verdict. And if you make the prediction correctly with the verdict, you make profit. If you make the prediction against the verdict, you lose your stake. So the only incentive you have is to make the right prediction. And the right prediction means what the, the people will say, what the governors will say. Um, and the governors, they just have the incentive uh, 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 to say, well, to vote what they think. Of course, if they make predictions 
Um, I mean, you can, you, I, maybe I'm not understanding your question. You're, are you asking what happens if the voters make predictions themselves? That's the question. Sorry, it takes a couple of button clicks to get uh, to be able to talk again. So yes, I, I meant to be talking about the predictors. Uh, so you say the predictors might be bots at some point, but early on, the predictors are trying to make predictors about what the electorate would do, but the only data they have is about what uh, 100 voters or 50 voters or something uh, actually vote on. And is there incentive just to make the right prediction about what that small subset does, or is there some way to incent them to know what the electorate would do if you manage to poll the whole electorate? Right. So, so it's it's somewhere in between. So let's let's say that there is a hundred votes uh, in the in you know already casted in, and, the pool, yeah. and in the pool, and it goes to a yes, right? Yeah. Now, I think that it's going to be a no. So I think that the organization actually wouldn't make that decision. So I have the incentive now to make a bet. I'm going to stake that it's a no. And now I also have the incentive to flag to the organization, hey guys, look, there is, there is an attack here. There's 100 people who are running a budget on their party, and this is definitely not something with their entire organization want to spend on. So now I also have the incentive to flag out, to serve as the signaler for the organization. And, that and now more people- else, That lets everybody else know that they should weigh in and, and cast their actual vote. Uh, and, exactly. and if they agree with you, then you turn out to be right. That, exactly. That, that so, seems to work well. Okay. Exactly. So now I have now I serve also as the signaler. So that's the beauty of it. So the prediction system is both serving as is basic, basic serving as the guarding system for the voters. It's it's basically you can think of it as as navigating attention of the organization to the right places, to the places they predict are not aligned with the rest of the people. Um, okay, I think Howard had a comment to that. Howard, if you want to uh, mute yourself and uh, do the com come publicly. Otherwise, we move to Mindy. Howard. Okay, good. Then, Mindy, your question. And I just want to do an official time check. We're now 17 minutes over time. If any of the uh -huh. panelists at any point in time yes. have to hop on, please do so. And I just want to tell you from my end, thank you so, 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 so much for coming. This was incredible. I think we covered like a really, really wide range uh, in and in depth, so thanks so much. Uh, but if you want to stay on, from now on, we're going to have like you know more an open Q and A forum. But it's already 18 minutes past now, and um, so I'm, I won't, I won't, I won't demand that you stay on. But I would obviously love to if you did. Mindy. All right. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So, uh, hi, Maiten. Uh, very nice and fair representation model. Um, as, uh, however, as I've written, there are a couple of questions, you know, like um, uh, good prediction is rewarded, but prediction relies on knowledge and uh, uh, initial knowledge uh, may be not uh, uh, equally or equitably or fairly distributed, right? So how, does, how do we deal with that? Uh, um, uh, how do we allow some of the noise survive? And um, how do we deal with the non binary qualitative decisions. Uh, who, who, whenever it, we, we go to something like qualitative, we need to decide how do we measure it, right? And uh, so how do we, def, uh, you know, def, who and how do we define metrics? And also how do we come together to decide, uh, you know, like um, whenever, uh, when everyone is innovating with their own protocols, uh, how do we make people actually come together to make global decisions? So, I mean, um, um, how do, um, uh, what I mean is like, uh, uh, well, people building D apps or the decentralized apps, in particular crypto tokens, um, and, uh, and everyone's just trying to kind of box th th people into their own some protocol, like for example, um, Ethereum or NEO or some other, and um, these kind of events are subject to external marketing efforts, uh, in particular to specific blockchains. And uh, so, like, um, so how do you think how we, we, we could come together uh, to decide on global issues when, when there is such uh, diversity of these uh, uh, you know, protocols and, uh, and uh, uh, so much fragmentation in the, in the blockchain world? Um, 
uh, why I should use a particular blockchain and not yet start another one. And, uh, I mean, this is of course outside of your uh, you know, you know, decision uh, represent, re representation uh, uh, model, which I think could work uh, beyond all the all, all of blockchains. But uh, but but anyway, uh, maybe some thoughts on that would you know I, I would appreciate how, uh, what yeah. motivates you to stay on this particular one particular uh, chain uh, or something like that. Yeah, sure. So firstly, I, I mean, there were several questions. I'll try to answer two. Um, the first question, how do we take care of fair distribution of knowledge? The answer is we don't, and we don't need to. Uh, that's also true for algo trading. You know, trading, there is definitely not an even uh, information. If you're wiser, you have more information. If you're tracking it better, you have more information. If you know the participant better, you have more information. Um, actually making predictions on organizational decisions is much, much easier than making predictions on the market. So it's much better than, much easier than algo trading. Um, and there is no even additional uh, information, but there is no need to. The, the whole game of prediction is not there to make a fair, you know, distribution of anything. It's just there to make a good guardian system for the governance system. So those who are good at what they're doing, they make profits and they do more of that. And that's good because it's good to guard the governance system. So the, the, the target yeah, the of that system, system is not to make any, to, to, to guard the meritocratic voting system correctly. And the last question about the blockchain, I mean, I totally agree with you. Um, and that's, you know, that's what happens in the free market. Uh, you have five competitors and then uh, you, you think that you saw it all. And then there is a sixth one joining the ring and the seventh and, and never ends. But eventually, those who survive are those who actually function better. So basically, I would say that I, I think that the competition is still open because not none of those, none of those, well, not necessarily that's true, but the thing is that, not, that I think it's a good thing because it's a huge, I'm, I'm not, I think it's, it's hard to even estimate how hard it is to make a good, fast, scalable, and safe blockchain. I think none of them, and, and, and of course, uh, computationally, like Turing Complete, um, none of them has made it yet. So, and there is thousands of the best brains yeah. on the planet working on it. And I think it's actually important that different people have different ideas. So I think it's important that we explore all of those ideas. We saturate the landscape of ideas. And, and I think there is a good, fairly good correlation of good ideas and the winners, at least from what I see. Um, and also, by the way, different blockchains have different design re requirements. So those, eventually, I don't think there will be one winner. There will be yeah. several winners, which will have somewhat different blockchains that serve somewhat different use cases. Um, they, for, for example, some blockchain will be more decentralized than others. Uh, some other blockchain will be more mm. uh, fast, but less decentralized, and so on and so forth. Um, why I'm on Ethereum, so I have I like a database is uh, cap theorem or Right. But, but eventually, just as there is a, a movement of frag fragmentation, there is also a movement of uh, interoperability. So there's already a bunch of projects that are working on interoperability of blockchains, such that eventually, if you ask me what will what happen eventually, so my, my guesstimate is that in 10 years, there will be no such thing as blockchain. You'd have like a mesh of consensus networks, and basically you'd be able to tune the level of consensus that you need and the amount of cost that you are willing to pay for that consensus. Um, so why I am working today on Ethereum, because I think it's by far, by, by 100x better than anything else existing out there, if you, um, if you assume, if you want to have decentralization. If you don't want to have serious decentralization, you can have other things, but then I would go, just go to use Amazon, AWS, uh, if you actually consider decentralization, I think Ethereum is by far the best. There are a few competitors, um, but we are not religiously tied to Ethereum. If tomorrow there is another good system, we will definitely uh, uh, interoperate with that as well. So. All right, thank you. Uh, is there anyone else uh, here who has a... Mindy, let's... let's get, oh, Ed, Ed, I see you. Ed, okay, I'm going to unmute you. Let's, let's give the chance to Ed for asking a question, and then maybe we have time for one more, but uh, get ready, guys. One to Tom and one to Matan, uh, because I'm intrigued by what Tom is doing, and I've been following Dow Stack for quite a while, and I really want to connect more strongly, so that's part of what I'm doing. Uh, along with Jim Medali, who is here, uh, we're working on creating a uh, virtual 
business accelerator on the internet to move environmental technology out of the lab and into the world faster. And we're looking at using blockchain with a name of having an aim or an intention of having 10,000 people involved. And we have a group assembled around that, which has been going on for a number of months. Uh, we call it YARCCE, Y-A-R-C-C-E. Uh, and I would like to learn more from you, Tom Bell, if there's some way to connect with you and maybe have you Zoom with our group, or at least some subset of it. We're talking to attorneys up in Vermont about uh, creating a blockchain-based LLC, and we'll be meeting with them a second time in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Matan, we have been looking at the Colony software. We'd really like to be able to do a, a comparison and see which fits our needs or if it's some combination. We have a regular Saturday morning uh, Zoom session where we have people from Italy, Milan, across the United States, uh, and uh, also Spain, give us discussion and learning. It's our study group about the blockchain. And we'd like to find a way to learn more about your software. I'm really hoping that Common is the new name and it's no longer Alchemy, because I had one guy run like a scared deer as soon as somebody said Alchemy, and he said, that's changing lead into gold, that's fraud, I'm out of here. And so I hope that marketing issue is off the wayside because I had a hard time defending it uh, with that name. So, so those are my quick let, questions. Let, let, let me answer because it's quick and also because I need to go to the crying baby. Um, <laughs> I, I would just love to hear from any of you uh, my email is matan, M-A-T-A-N, at daustak.io, and I welcome anyone to just reach out to me and, and, and happy to chat about this. And yes, the new app, app is called Common, and it, it's, it's really cool. You need to see it. So thanks, everyone. I need to drop off. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay, he's gone. So then, Tom, you can handle the next question then for, from, from Ed as well. I'm happy to, but I, I just heard Ed saying, you know, he wants to reach out. So Ed, if you look in the chat, I have a couple of email addresses. Be happy to talk with you or your team later. Okay. And mine is very easy. It's ed at yarish.com. My name that's there, an at sign, a dot com at the end. Thank you. Okay. Lovely. Next one up, we have James with a question to Tom. James, I'll unmute you. Hi, Tom. I uh, appreciate your presentation and what you're doing. Um, I have a couple questions around the common problems that I read about in, in the, the current case law uh, system. W one of those issues would be how, uh, how are, do they determine what type of injuries are claimable um, and what would be considered a reasonable claim for that? Um, is there like a, an open source system to feed into that and figure out uh, like what makes sense on, on, in that way? Um, and then the other question is um, in, in the, the standard common law court system, uh, a lot of decisions are like analysis after look at decisions and say, oh, well, if if the jury considered each piece of evidence, you know, piecewise, then the decision would be different because there's all these cognitive biases that, uh, that like naturally happen when people look at a whole bunch of different factors and have to weigh in on them at once. And is there, is that addressed, um, in the ULEX system? Uh, thank you for your questions. Question one, um, about causes of action. That is determined by looking at the rules. There is in ULEX, for example, you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned a tort cause of action, the restatement second of torts. And so if someone slapped you in the face unprovoked and you thought, can I sue that person? You would go look in the restatement of torts and we'd discover, yes, you have a claim. It's defined there for battery, perhaps assault. And from there, you know, you might have to talk to an attorney, probably not actually. It's, it's pretty clearly written, the restatement of torts. And you would say, well, look, he struck me unprovoked. It's an offensive touching. It was unconsented. Boom, battery, and you go sue. Um, and there's other rules for you know, family law and contract disputes and corporate governance issues. There's a ton of rules. So we got almost everything covered, everything important. No intellectual property, no copyright and patents, but don't get me started. The other question about juries. I didn't put juries into ULEX for a number of reasons. I hope you would think they were well considered if I went through them. But basically, I don't think our jury system in the United States now works at all. It doesn't work at all the way it was supposed to work, the way it once did work in ye old England. 
I don't see any way to salvage it really. I really don't. So basically I'm skipping that whole mess. I'll just say one more thing that might give you, I don't know if it'll give you assurance, but it might kind of answer some of these questions at the periphery. I want to emphasize that in ULEX, the way the adjudication is set up, the judges have very little power and that is by design. I'm against the standing judiciary. I think it is a crime against the rule of law that we have government agents deciding disputes against the government. That is obscene. There's nowhere else we let that happen except when our government does it to us. So in ULEX, I try to take out as much um, um, independent decision-making power from the judges as possible. All they can do is choose either the plaintiff's remedy or the defendant's remedy. They don't get to do this split the baby stuff. So there's no room for a jury. You don't need a jury. The plaintiff says, here's my best argument, and here are the facts on my side. And the, and the, the, the plaintiff and defendant both offer these pleadings. They actually go back and forth a few times to see you know, how far apart they are. And this process will drive them towards agreement. So in contrast to traditional arbitration where the parties go to extremes because they try to convince the judge to go split the baby their way in the middle, ULEX does it, I didn't make this up. This comes actually from, it's called pendulum arbitration. It's used in um, uh, free agent baseball negotiations. Um, basically, you have to give the judges the best solution compared to the other party. You're not going to go rushing to the extreme because they might say, well, you got a good case, buddy, but you got greedy. We just can't sign on to that. We don't like this other way of resolving dispute either, but they didn't get so greedy. And so basically, there's no room for a jury. There's hardly any room for the judges. The judges just have to say, hmm, do I choose the plaintiff or defendant? They don't get to make things up, and that is a good thing. All right. Uh, strong, <laughs> strong closing here, I'd say. So... Uh, I know that we still have a number of people that are on here. Uh, it seems like there's interest to talk about this further. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up breakout rooms. Um, for those who still want to continue talking, they can go out over there. I'm going to close out uh, the official salon with a very, very, very big heartfelt thank you. I thought we had like three really fantastic presentations. Thank you so much for making it. Uh, I couldn't even have predicted how well they actually fit into each other. So um, I'm really, really happy um, how that how that panned out. Uh, I think a lot of the kind of like you know um, underlying um, underlying contextual uh, kind of like uh, yeah underlying contextual alignments like only became uh, apparent to me like throughout the talk. So I'm really, really happy uh, that that worked so well. Um, and I'm hoping that I see many of you again next Thursday. Uh, I will um, share, the, uh, share this video uh, in, um, in, in the Hypermind group in, in, a, in a second, really, um, hopefully. Okay, not in a second, a few hours. Let me be precise here. Uh, and I thank you, Tom, for still being on. Brian, if you're still on, thank you too. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm going to open up invitations to the breakout rooms now for those who still want to talk. And I see all of you in like more official framing again here next Thursday.